The Gold Bug by Edgar Allan Poe. Part 4. Cracking Captain Kidd's Code. Legrand had been heeding the parchment again as he spoke, and now he handed it to me. A group of mysterious symbols in a reddish ink was neatly arranged in the center of the parchment between the skull and the goat. But, I said, as I returned the parchment to him, I am as much in the dark as ever. The solution, answered my friend, is not as difficult as it seems at first glance. From what I've heard about Kidd, he wasn't a particularly clever man, so I was sure he couldn't have come up with a really complicated code. But even a simple one would appear to an uneducated sailor hunting for the treasure to be a complete puzzle. And you really solved it? Easily. I have always been interested in such riddles, and I have solved others a thousand times harder. After all, one human being cannot invent a puzzle which other human beings would be unable to solve. In all secret writings, the first problem is to discover the language of the code. Generally, trial and error is the only way, but here the signature gave it away immediately. The pun upon the word kid occurs only in English. Otherwise, I would have tried French and Spanish first, since kid was a pirate of the Spanish main. Of course, the problem is that, as you can see, there are no divisions between the words. If there were, it would have been clear that a word of one symbol would be a or I, and a word of two symbols could be is, if, it, or, or he. But since there were no word divisions, my first step was to count all of the symbols to see which were the most frequent and which the least frequent. I arranged the symbols into a table like this. Of the characters eight, there are thirty-three. Of semicolon, there are twenty-six. Of four, there are nineteen. Of double cross and close parentheses, there are sixteen. Of asterisks, there are thirteen. Of five, there are twelve. Of six, there are eleven. Of open parentheses, there are ten. Of cross and one, there are eight. Of zero, there are six. Of the characters nine and two, there are five. Of colon and three, there are four. Of question mark, there are three. Of paragraph mark, there are two. And of exclamation and hyphen, there are only one. Now in English, the letter E occurs most frequently. E is so frequent, in fact, that there is practically never a sentence of any length in which it is not the most repeated letter. After that, the most frequent letters in order are A O I D H N R S T U Y C F G L M W B K P Q X Z. So in this code, I felt I was on very safe ground by assuming that the letter 8 represents E. There's an easy way to check this out. E is very often doubled in English in such words as meet, fleet, speed, agreed and so on. No other letter is doubled so often. I said, following his explanation easily. I see here that the double eight appears five times in this message. Exactly. So we can be pretty sure eight is E. Now of all words in the language, the is the most common. So if there are three symbols repeated several times in the same order, with the last symbol being eight, they probably represent the word the. And so there are, I said as excited as though it were my own discovery, I see six, no, seven such arrangements. Yes, the symbols are semicolon four eight. So we may assume that semicolon represents T, four represents H, and eight represents E. Now that we have established a single word, we can also establish the beginnings and endings of several other words. Look, for instance, on the fifth line of the message where the combination semicolon 48 occurs and is followed by a semicolon. We know that the semicolon must be the beginning of the next word, and we already know five of the six symbols after this the. They are semicolon, opening parentheses, 88 semicolon 4. We know that semicolon is T, we don't know open parentheses, and we know that 88 is EE and 4 is H. If we write them down, leaving a space for the one unknown letter, we have... Now, by trying the entire alphabet, I cannot find any letter to fit the space to make one word ending with TH, so I assume that the TH is part of the next word, leaving T. By going through the alphabet, I found the letter R is the best possibility to fill the space after T. That gives us... Tree. And we learn that R is represented by open parentheses. Looking for the next combination of semicolon 48 we find the repeated again seven symbols after the tree. The tree, semicolon, four, double cross, question mark, 34, the. 
substituting the natural letters where we know them, it looks like this. And he wrote, the tree, THR, double cross, question mark, 3H, the. As soon as I saw what he had written, I could guess the missing letters, A-U-G, through, of course. And so we have three new letters, I said. A, U, and G, represented by double cross, question mark, and three, right? Right. Now let... Now let's look through the message for combinations of symbols we know. On the second line of the message, this arrangement appears. Double cross 83, open parentheses 88. Substituting the letters we know, we get cross E-G-R-E-E. -E. This looks very much like the word degree and gives us another letter. D represented by the symbol cross. Still on the second line, four symbols beyond the word degree, we see the combination semicolon 46 open parentheses semicolon 88 asterisk. Substituting the letters we know and leaving a space for the unknown, it looks like this. T-H-6-R-T-E-E -E asterisk. This immediately suggests the word 13. That gives us two new letters, I and N, repeated by six and asterisk. I cried. Correct, said Legrand. Now look at the very beginning of the message. See the combination. 53, double cross, double cross, cross. We know that three double cross, double cross, cross are five good. So we guess that the first letter is A, and that the first two words of the message are A good. Now we have quite a few letters, so we can write down our key in the table to avoid confusion. As he spoke, Legrand was writing, five represents A, cross represents D, eight represents E, 3 represents G, 4 represents H, 6 represents I, asterisk, represents N, double cross represents O, open parentheses represents R, semicolon represents T, question mark represents U. We don't have to go any further, he said. You see for yourself how it works, so here is the full translation of the message, and he handed me these words. A good glass in the bishop's hostel, in the devil's seat, 41 degrees and 13 minutes northeast, and by north main branch, seventh limb east side, shoot from the left eye of the death's head, a bee line from the tree through the shot 50 feet out. But, I said after reading it, even this translation still leaves me in the dark. What is the meaning of all this stuff about a devil's seat and a bishop's hostel? It also left me in the dark for a few days, replied Legrand. Then I asked all over Sullivan's Island and the mainland about any building that was called Bishop's Hotel, for of course I dropped the old-fashioned word, hostel. But I got no information. One morning, I got the idea that this might refer to a family named Bessop. They have owned an old plantation about four miles north of the island for well over a century. So I went over to the mainland and asked some of the older people who worked there. One of the most aged of the women said she had heard of a place known as Bessop's Castle. She agreed to take me there, but said that it was neither a castle nor a hotel. It was just a high rock. I offered to pay her well for her trouble, and we found the spot without much difficulty. Then I sent her back. The castle was a cluster of cliffs and rocks, one of them extremely high. I climbed to the top, but then felt completely at a loss. I couldn't imagine what to do next. While I stood on that rock, thinking it over, my eyes fell upon a narrow ledge on the eastern side of the rock. It was about a yard below me. It stuck out about eighteen inches and was only about a foot wide. The shape of the cliff just above it made it look something like one of those old hollowed back chairs people used to have. The devil's seat, I exclaimed. Just what I thought, he answered. And then the full secret of the riddle dawned on me. A good glass, I knew, could only be a telescope, for the word glass is used the way by sailors. I realized at once that a telescope was to be used from this exact location. The instructions for the angle at which to hold it were very precise. The phrases 41 degrees and 13 minutes and northeast and by north were clearly directions for leveling the telescope. At these discoveries I was, you can be sure, greatly excited. I hurried home, got my telescope, and returned to the rocky cliff at once. I let myself down to the ledge and found it was possible to sit upon it in only one position. This confirmed my idea. Then I used the telescope. With my pocket compass, I made sure of the northeast and by north direction and pointed the glass as nearly at an angle of 41 degrees as I could by guesswork. I moved it cautiously up and down very slowly until I saw a circular opening in the leafy top of the tallest tree in the distance. In the center of this clearing, there seemed to be a white spot, but at first I could not make out what it was. 
I adjusted the focus of the telescope and looked again. It was a human skull. The death's head, I exclaimed. With this discovery, the puzzle was solved. The phrase main branch, seventh limb, east side could only mean the position of the skull upon the tree, and shoot from the left eye of the death's head had to mean to drop a bullet from the left eye socket to the skull. Then a bead line, or in other words, a straight line, drawn from the nearest point of the trunk through the shot, or spot where the bullet fell, and continued for fifty feet out, would indicate a definite point, and I thought it at least possible that beneath this point something of value was hidden. This is all quite clear, I said, although very clever, quite ingenious. When you left the Bessop's castle, what then? Why, I noted carefully the location of the tree and then went home. But what was most curious was that, the instant I left the devil's seat, I could no longer see the circular opening. Turn as I would, it could not be observed. It seemed to me that the cleverest part of the whole thing is the fact that the clearing is visible only from the narrow ledge. So we missed the spot the first try at digging, I commented, because Jupiter let the bug fall through the right eye socket instead of the left. Precisely, he answered. This mistake made a difference of about two and a half inches in the position of the shot or peg nearest the tree. If the treasure had been directly beneath the shot, it wouldn't have mattered. But the shot was one of the two points for setting the line of direction, so while the error was small in the beginning, it increased as we continued along the line. By the time we had gone fifty feet, we were way off the mark, I finished the sentence for him. But the way you were carrying on, talking in that dramatic voice, and swinging the beetle, I was sure you were mad. And why did you insist on letting the bug fall instead of a bullet? Well, to tell you the honest truth, I was quite annoyed by your evident suspicions about my sanity. I resolved to punish you quietly, in my own way, with a little extra mystification. What Jupiter said about the weight of the beetle gave me the idea. So that's it, I said, and now there's only one last thing that still puzzles me. What about the skeletons we found in the pit? I don't know the answer to that any more than you do, but I can guess, although it is dreadful to believe in such an atrocity, it is clear that Kidd would have needed help carrying the box and digging the hole. But after the work was done, he may have decided to cover his tracks completely and do away with all who knew his secret. Perhaps a couple blows on the head with a pickaxe while his men were busy digging. Perhaps it required a dozen blows. Who shall tell? Indeed, who shall ever tell?